Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Greetings once more in uh, every part of the world, wherever you are tuning in from. It's um, yet another pleasure to chat to you about the great love of God. You see, uh, the statement that I just made, the great love of God, sends uh, thrills or chills through the spines of some people. When we discuss God, and when we discuss religion, particularly Christianity, some people think, <laughs> some people think with all due respect, that um, we are delving into inferiority. Well, in this particular study, I, or rather presentation, I want to go against that uh, gray. As far as the Bible is concerned, we were created by God. Okay? As far as faith is concerned, we were created by God. I haven't found any more, any plausible explanation beyond that. Yeah, I hear about evolution. It's not plausible enough. I think you need more faith to believe in evolution than to believe in scripture. So, I just want to show that this, the Bible is meant or rather designed to make us better human beings. Not just better morally, but better in every way. It's supposed to make or inspire young people to become great scientists, great philosophers, great workmen, great tradesmen, great statesmen, great everything. Great everything. That's, that's how the Bible is structured. The study of scripture is, is designed, I'm not talking about reading it, I'm talking about studying it, is designed to sharpen the intellect. Far more than anything else we can study. There is so much grace in scripture. As you sharpen the intellect, your character, through the Bible that is, your character also develops for the better. Don't, don't look at the people around. The examples of, um, uh, of Christians that you see around, those are not good enough. You should look on the ultimate example, whom you can read about in the gospel, in the four gospels. Even the founder of Christianity, Christ himself, the beginning of the creation of God. So, speaking um, to his disciples and um, uh, some uh, people on a mount, 2,000 years ago, we read from the history book written by Matthew. So the history book, which is part of the compilation, so the Bible is just a compilation of 66 books and letters. So let's zoom into this particular one, the history book written by Matthew. So it's Matthew um, chapter 5 towards the end, and it's, um, let's pick it up from verse 43. So Matthew says, quotes Jesus saying, maybe I should say. So Matthew is quoting Jesus here, and uh, Jesus was, was saying the following. Ye have heard that it has been said, that it had been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. Okay, let's, let's pause there. So if you read the Old Testament, you get this particular character of God, this God whom we don't understand. Uh, he is called Jehovah. He is, he is cruel. He gives instant punishment. Uh, he wants his law to be, ab to be abided by so strictly. He is a very strict God. Um, he kills the man who tries to save the ark from falling. 
uh, as it was being returned from, um, uh, from the non-Jewish land it had gone to. We find a God who, who, who gives the death penalty. In South Africa, we don't have a death penalty. I don't know in, uh, how many other countries look down on the death penalty. So South Africa doesn't have a death penalty. So we, 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 we come across this God, this Jehovah. But when you read the New Testament, then you come across a different person altogether. So this person that we come across in the New Testament, he is so loving, you would slap him and he won't do anything to you. At least that's the picture that's, um, th that, that he seems to be painting in the New Testament. Now, the question is, is that true? Who is this Jehovah and who is this Jesus that we find in the New Testament? John tells us in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and it goes on and so forth. It is the same God. When we read from Matthew chapter 22, we actually learn that uh, David called him God. He was the I am. So this God that they were calling I am in the Old Testament is the same God who is speaking in the New Testament. Now, so you would find that the, in the way scripture is written, there is also the hand of man trying to portray in human language and intellect the inspiration and thoughts of God. So God inspires the thought to write on something, but the actual words contain the imperfection of humanity, rather fallen humanity. So, don't throw away the, the, the Bible, simply because you find some things that seem not to tally quite well. No, read further than that. Go deeper and find the inspired thought that, was being, uh, uh, that the author was trying to, uh, to bring across. And when you find that inspired thought, you would find that it permeates the space-time fabric of scripture. So, Jesus is saying, you have been told that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now he is saying, in verse 44, but I say unto you, he says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that uh, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So if someone is doing evil to you, when someone is doing bad to you, what should you do? You should love them. What a tough law that is. Well, let's continue. The reason why you should love your enemy, verse 45, is the following. So we're on Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. The reason why you should love your enemy and... Um, love them that despite you and so forth, is the following. That ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he uh, maketh his son to shine, or rather to rise, on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. <laughs> you can imagine if God was like us. There are people today, or rather tomorrow, when the sun rises, they will be in darkness while the others are in light. There are people who would have no food while the others have plenty. There are people that would, um, w when the rain falls, they would have the rain. They would enjoy the showers of blessing while the others have nothing. But God is saying, if you want to be children of God. You need to be like God. And uh, what is God like? Well, we realize that God makes the sun shine on everyone. Those who wrong him and those who worship him. Those who worship idols and those that worship the true God, they still get the same sunshine. If we want to be like God, rather, um, if we want to be like God, yes, we need the thought of God to be in us. So we need to do good 
to those who hate us. And then he asks, if you love them, if, if, if after you believe in God, after you believe in Christ, you are now a Christian, and you love those who love you only, and so, so what reward do you have you? If, on, if you salute, if you greet those that greet you only, what's the difference between you and the evil person? Because the evil person also loves the people that are good to him. So the person who is ignorant of God, who hasn't met this God, on he has selective love. But when we meet this Christ, when we meet this God, what should we do? We should be like God. Now, let's get to the gist of it. Be ye therefore perfect. Verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. That word perfect is packed. We need to be perfect in every way and in everything. You see, when we study nature as scientists, when we go, everything that we study, maybe, maybe let me zoom into the nature as scientists. So when we study nature as scientists, we are reading the first book given to humanity by God after creation. You see, when Adam had been created, he was given nature to name the animals. Yes. So as he was naming the animals, he was studying nature. So you had to study, what's the behavior, what should I call it? What's the behavior, what should I call it? So you were studying nature. The Bible came in many, many years later. That's when the first written scripture came in. When we study nature, we are studying the creation of God. We are studying the gift of God. We were told in Genesis chapter 1 to subdue the earth. In other words, the Bible uh, scholar, the Christian, the believer, is supposed to be very intelligent, is supposed to be um, very sharp, very thorough in whatever he does. If he is hired to clean a house, if he is hired to mow the lawn, he should do it with absolute perfection, as though doing it unto the Lord. So, Christians usually have this uh, misunderstanding, rather, that when you are a Christian, so if you are a student, you can get into the exam room without studying, and somehow the Holy Spirit will remind, will, will tell you what the answers are. Many Christians have set a better example because of that. The Lord requires us to be perfect, as he is perfect. So when we study, we must study knowing that the angels are recording accurately what we are doing. So when the Holy Spirit works with us, he will work with us to remind us of what we have done. If we become a statesman, be honest. If you become an accountant, a treasurer, whatever you do, whatever we do, no matter how small it may be, we need to be perfect. Jesus was so perfect that rising from the grave, from the grave into which he would never return, he had to fold the cloth that raped him nicely. The one that raped the, the head nicely where the head was and the one that raped the body nicely, nicely folded where, where, where it was, to show us what kind of people we need to be. We need to take care of everything, including small things. We need to be perfect as God is perfect. We need to live sinless lives as God is sinless. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen.